Okay, so today we're going to talk about the intermediate value theorem, which is basically a result of a function being um, continuous. So basically what it says is that if you have a continuous function, and so let me kind of pull this graph up. If you have a continuous function that is continuous on a closed interval from A to B, and if you pick any number um, that is between the height at f of A and the height at f of B, so look, so here's our height of f of A and our height of f of B. If we pick any, any number in there, because for us to connect from this height up to this height, we had to go through that number. There must be a C somewhere such that f of C is equal to that number. Now this is very useful if you're trying to find a zero because the intermediate value theorem lets us say that if we have a continuous function and one is down below the x-axis and one is up above the x-axis, if we had to connect to it with a continuous function, wouldn't we have to pass through zero? So that's where the intermediate value theorem can be so helpful, is if it's continuous and we are at a positive and a negative, we had to connect and go through zero. So it helps us to determine where the zero lies. So that's where it is important. And I usually will abbreviate it IVT, so if you, if you see that abbreviation, that's kind of what it stands for. So it says, according to uh, the intermediate value theorem, um, the cosine minus the sine minus x equals 2 has a solution over the interval from negative 1 to 1. Uh, show that. Okay. <coughs> so let's think about what the intermediate value theorem states. It states that if we plug into a continuous function. So let's call our continuous function f of x is the cosine of x minus the sine of x minus x. If it's continuous on the interval given and the f of uh, a and the f of b values, um, if there's two between them, we know the solution equal to 2 will be in that interval. So how do we check it? Well, one, is it continuous? Well, yeah, a cosine is continuous everywhere, a sine is continuous everywhere, and x is continuous everywhere. So if you add them in or subtract them or whatever, guess what? It's continuous. So all you got to do is plug in negative 1. Now we're going to assume that these are in radians. So if you are using a calculator, uh, negative 1 radian is about negative 50 something de degrees. Positive 1 radian is about 50 something degrees. I think it's 52. What is it? 180 divided by pi. Yeah, oh, 57. 57.2 or 57. Point. Um, so when we do the cosine of negative 1, <coughs> make sure your calculator is reading radians. Okay. So if we put that into our calculator, let me do that. So we get that our first value, f of negative 1, is about 2.4. Go to the nearest tenth. And then I'm going to draw uh, a very crude picture of it. It's not going to be correct, but and we'll pull it up on Desmos because that's going to be much more accurate than what I can do. And now let's try f of 1. So that's the cosine of 1 minus the sine of 1 minus So. f of 1 is about negative 1.4. Now, 
We know it's continuous. So I'm going to draw, like I said, a very rough picture. This is not what the picture looks like, but it will give you a sense of what's happening. So I'm just going to put those points on it, only those points. I, I don't care what's happening everywhere else. At negative 1, I'm at 2.5. At positive 1, I'm at negative 1.5. Now, this function is continuous. So our function to get from the point negative 1, 2.4 to the point positive 1, negative 1.3, it's something like that. Now, do I know what it is? No, I, I don't care. <laughs> it's something like that. Okay. The question is, show that that thing equals 2 somewhere. Right there. Do I know what that is? No. But because, because 2 is between f of negative 1 and f of 1, there is a solution. And again, it's because of the intermediate value theorem and the fact that these are continuous functions. Now, if we pulled up Desmos to get a much, much better picture than I would get, Cosine of x minus the sine of x minus x. We're going to restrict it between negative 1 and negative 1. I wish you could do that too. So that's what the fun, hey, my graph wasn't too horrible. <laughs> a little squeaky earlier than that. <coughs> but do we hit a y value of 2? Well, sure we do. Do I care what it is? No. That's not necessarily, they did. The intermediate value theorem uh, shows us that a value exists in there. It doesn't tell us what the value happens to be. Okay, so there's that. And then uh, we're going to draw at least we're going to hope to draw a picture. We'll see. Okay. So it says sketch the graph of a function that has the following five or oh, four properties. Okay. So our function uh, only goes from 0 to 5. So just to remind myself of that, I'm going to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm just going to mark those in a color so I, I, that shows up. Okay. As we approach 1 from the right, and as we approach 1 from the left, the function, the limits exist and are equal. So as we approach uh, an x value of 1, does it tell us what they are? No. Um, so let's just, I don't know, we'll make a picture. So. So we're going to start here, and we're going to go uh, here. And then we're going to kind of have a tail on the other side. I don't know where we're going next. Okay. f of x is left continuous, but not continuous at x equals 2. So at x equals 2, it's going to go up to 2, and it's going to be continuous on the left side. And then it's, uh, but not continuous at 2. And right continuous, but not continuous at x equals 3. So let's do a 3 here. Okay. What else? Uh, 
f of x has a removable discontinuity at 1, so it has a whole 1. But the domain goes from 0 to 5, so let's just put another dot somewhere out there because it has to be a, a point somewhere. It has a jump kiss continuity at 2, so let's do this. Wait, it says that one's not... How do I do that? Uh, let's do this. Okay, so it has a jump discontinuity at 2. The following limits hold. Gosh darn it. As we approach 3 from the left, we're going to negative infinity. Okay, well that erases this picture for me. Okay, so that means there's an asymptote here. And as we approach it from the left, we're going to have a negative infinity. That's a gross picture, but take that. Okay. Uh, and as we approach it from the right, we're a height of 2. But thanks for telling me that. So we're going to go up and go to 1, 2. Oh, we stop at 5. I got overexcited there. Okay, 2. Let's go. Okay, so let's see if <laughs> all of that mess fits everything they asked of us. Okay. The domain is from 0 to 5, so I have all points from 0 to 5 accounted for. Yes. From the left of 1, it exists. From the right of 1, it exists, and they're equal. Yes. From the left side of 2, it's continuous. At 2, and the right continuous, but not continuous at 3. So right continues at 3, yes. It has a removable discontinuity at x equals 1, yes. It has a jump at 2, yes. As we approach 3 from the right, we're going to negative infinity. As we approach 3, or from the left, I'm sorry. As we approach 3 from the right, we're hitting a height of 2. Okay. Now, if you were drawing it, and we were sitting right next to each other, my drawing might be a little different because you could put little bumps here. You can put a little difference. There are some things that can be different. So this is one possibility. Does that make sense? It's weird. It is, as you can see. And sometimes you'll draw a little piece and go like I did, like, ah, oh, that doesn't quite fit, you know? Okay. So uh, your homework for 2.4 so we also had 2.3 this week, is that, is that right? So 2.4 <coughs> and 2.3, we're all, that's all we're going to be um, working on in class tomorrow. Okay. So let's uh, go into the book. So here is the 2.4. Let's just kind of go over the instructions real quick. So in this first section here, <laughs> from 131 to 137, it says, for the following exercises, to determine the points at which the function is discontinuous. <laughs> Classify each discontinuity as a jump, removable, infinite, or other. So just think for our fractional exponent or our fractional functions your denominator can't equal zero. Uh, if square roots have to be greater than or equal to zero. Um, and feel free for those ones um, to look at what's happening in decimals. Decimals can really help you there. For this section, 
up to 141 here. It says the side of the functions are continuous at the given point. If it is discontinuous, what's the reason? And we discussed how to do that. We had some examples like that. And then 145 and 147, those are ones uh, we had done where, uh, remember the example that we did yesterday that was like, uh, what's the C value that would make this thing continuous? Look at that example to help you with 145 and 147. And then 153 uh, is like the example we had done with that sine function, um, looking at where it has a solution. So where are they equal? And then 157 um, is, I think, to draw a graph that has all those properties. Okay. So I did try to do an example like each of those. So there you go. There's 2.4.